It's one of the most common road trips in Massachusetts, the journey to Cape Cod. For some like me, it's a couple times a year adventure. For others, it's every warm weather weekend and then some. But this past summer, staff at the Boston Globe headed to the Cape with a different mission, to draw attention to a crisis endangering the iconic peninsula. We leave ordinary life for a week or two of sun and sand. We play in the waves, make memories. But the Cape we love is under siege. The warming planet is attacking its shores, its habitats, its essence at an alarming pace. This is insane! Year after year, we come here to play. This time, we come for our reckoning. And their new feature at the edge of a warming world, a globe team chronicles the dangers ahead, as well as the many ways climate change is already permanently changing the Cape. The author, globe columnist Nestor Ramos, joins me now. Nestor, it's good to see you, along with the state senator for the Cape and Islands, Julian Sears Center. It's good to meet you, too. Thanks for being here. Can we start with the Omen family? John, because I know this joint from mm -hmm. years ago. John Omen and his son Liam owned this clam shack, Nosset Beach. They thought they had years to go. And then all of a sudden, uh, a storm hit and the building was leveled uh, last year. Here they are. It was just a perfect storm. 80 feet of 30-foot high sand dunes gone in 13 hours. It took away so much. I thought maybe, oh, we're probably going to lose maybe 30 feet. It's a very violent storm. There are a couple roads that continue farther out on Google Maps but do not exist anymore because they've been cut off by the water. You know, it'd be comforting if that was aberrational, but as you tell, the beach erosion, the be beach disappearance is at record levels. What's the number of feet per year? It's about three feet on the outer cape, uh, although it varies a lot north to south. Dramatically more than, as you say, thousands of years before. Yeah, for yes. thousands of years it was pretty slow and steady, and then the rising seas have really increased the rate. How did this happen, though? They said it to you. Uh, the, they thought they had 10 years left, enough for the father to retire, for the son Liam, after which obviously the place had been renamed, to do something with it. Why did this happen so quickly and so severely? Well, that's the thing about averages, right? If we're talking hundreds of years, three feet a year can be zero feet one year and can be uh, what happened to them the next, which is something like 80 feet in a night. Um, and the, another effect of climate change, as some of the scientists I talked to describe, is that these storms are more frequent in addition to being more powerful. And uh, so you end up losing huge chunks, much bigger than they did in any of the 30 to 40 years there. You know, Senator, long before you, you know this, they may not know this, long before you were state senator, you had environmental background as an intern in the White House, obviously in the State Department of Public Health under Deval Patrick. But the sense I get as a frequent Cape traveler, it's totally anecdotal, people are in total denial about how fast this is coming and how severely it's coming. Am I wrong? Well, I think for Cape Codders who've, you know, been living on the Outer Cape, um, you know, this is, this is something we've been witnessing and seeing and, and, and why I really love this piece, right, is it shows, uh, really shows what we've been seeing, you know. Um, I think what's changing is the acceleration of it. So, you know, the piece talks about Boston Beach, which around the corner from where I grew up mm. and where I live. You're um, a true kid. Um, true kid, yeah. Um, and, you know, I remember, I remember when that broke. I think it was a nor'easter uh, in 1993. And it's significant because the Pamet River sort of runs there. Um, I remember that. What's changed is the acceleration of it. So why are people not moving back? I mean, it's so obvious to me that instead of fortifying, which I guess is the term of art, retreat is the direction yeah. well, people should sanely be going. I mean, no? fortunately for us, you know, we've got the Cape Cod National Seashore, so you're only talking about a few really dozen structures that are actually on the barrier beach. The bigger challenge for us is going to be, you know, communities and villages like Provincetown or in Chatham, uh, Route 28 along Pleasant Bay, that's where we're going to have to really figure things well, out. Well, and also one of the big challenges is what happens with the water and yeah. what have that industry. Here's Eric Hess, also from your work, a fisherman and a captain. Listen to him. Things really changed pretty dramatically, as if there were some kind of tipping point. The water got really hot that summer, and the fish just didn't come back, you know, the way they always had that winter. And we didn't really know what to do with ourselves. You know, I read one statistic that blew my socks off in this piece about the water is warming faster in parts here than what? About 99% of the world's oceans. And what, why is that? Well, it's pretty complicated. Um, How about the simple version? <laughs> <laughs> the simple version is that all the melting ice far north of the Gulf of Maine is, is uh, freshening the water up there that for, for centuries has 
flowed into the Gulf of Maine and made it cold, quite cold actually for its latitude. That's why the species of fish that we eat there are cold water species. And all that fresh water isn't as dense as salty water. And what's the consequence of this accelerated uh, heating, warming of the water? Well, it's, it's, the ripple effects are vast, right? Like if you're, if you're a cod, um, you, you can maybe survive it, but not when your population's been overfished already and you're, they're particularly susceptible when they're young. And then you've got um, uh, invasive species coming in, the green crabs that feast on eelgrass and um, uh, any manner, virtually everything underwater with a handful of exceptions. Is, How about is the effective. shellfish population? Is, that a fun, is, the, is the disappearance, and there is a virtual disappearance, mm -hmm. is that a function of the warming? Uh, to some degree. Uh, they, they, they're also particularly susceptible to the kind of storm runoff um, that leads to acidification near the shores because that's where they live. You know, this whole thing, I know you know this, you live yeah. there, you spend your life there, and you represent it. It's like, uh, reading this, it's like a litany of horrors. Like, every paragraph is, like, more troubling and shocking than the one before. Did you learn things that you didn't know as a I, lifelong resident? You know, I, I learned a few. The, the part that's... Um, What's most alarming to you? I mean, you know, Cape Cod's a dynamic environment, right? This is a, this is a sandbar that was left kind of 18,000 years ago. We always had sort of bought time with it. I think what's alarming is that decisions I think that we thought we'd have to make in 50, 100, 200 years are now in 20, 10, 20 years. Uh, and that's who is big, we, Beacon Hill or the people who live and work there? Uh, both, right? Uh -huh. We've got a highly, you know, we've got uh, 15 towns on Cape Cod. Uh, municipal government is, uh, you know, we've got local control. So really small towns, the town of Truro, right, 2,000 people. Um, it's going to need help from, from Beacon Hill. Uh, probably going to need help from the federal government to really, as well. What, really, what, you know, if you were the yep. czar of this, this is both yeah. of you, and you could dictate the two or three things that should happen, whether it's by the residents, property owners, business owners, or your colleagues on Beacon Hill, what are, what's at the top yep. of the list? I like to look at it in two buckets. So first we're going to look at adaptation. So how do we, what are all the things we can do to catch up to live differently? And that's everything from, you know, far offshore wind, which we're finally being mm. part of that solution, although the Trump administration is holding us up. Uh, that's in doing planning and looking at, all right, when we're going to be building new structures, where are we going to permit things, where are we going to allow things, where are we not going to allow things. The other piece is around mitigation. Um, the thing about the Cape, though, we have a lot less hard infrastructure than, say, the South Shore mm. does. Um, so we're, we're able to kind of roll, roll with the waves a little bit better. So, but, yeah. so what do the people you talk to think is most important to be done here, to, if not prevent, but at least slow down what's going on? Well, the people on the Cape and the state really as a whole, to your credit, have, are doing this as well or better than most anywhere in the country, um, maybe California. Um, but uh, to your other point, which I think is really instructive, some of these town governments simply don't have the resources or even really the, the sort of... Uh, uh, apparatus to solve these problems, right? Like town government and state government are necessarily deliberative. You meet and then you have a public meeting and then you get your permission from the EPA and then you get your permission because maybe there's some plovers out there. And it takes years to solve a problem that with one winter uh, a storm could solve for you real quick. Is this going to cause people to get religion? We only have 30 seconds left. This piece, it caused me. I knew a lot of it. I didn't know nearly all of it. Is it going to cause people to get religion and appreciate the urgency? I mean, I sure hope so. Most of the Cape Codders I talk to, we've got religion. We see what's coming. We know what's coming. Um, maybe we don't have the resources to exactly figure out what that should be. Um, but we've got to move really swiftly on this. I'm hoping, I, I know we'll be taking action in the Senate on this. Um, and, 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 you know, I appreciate we've been working hard on it. The problem, though, is just so big. We're going to, we're going to, we're probably going to need double the resources we even think we're going to need. Hope you get them, Senator. Good to meet Thank you. you. Thanks so much, Nestor. Congratulations to you and your colleagues. Great work. Thanks,